Hi, everyone. My name is Prem Kumar, CEO and co-founder of Humanly. I'm really excited to chat with you all today about a topic that I'm very much passionate about. Uh, the topic today is the state of AI in talent acquisition, separating the hype from the reality. There certainly is a lot of hype. There's also a lot of real impacts that businesses are realizing in the talent acquisition space. So um, I'll start by telling you just a little bit about myself and my journey. I spent about 10 years at Microsoft, um, primarily in product management capacities. Um, I was the PM for our global HR portal, worked on a lot of HR tech initiatives as well as um, within that talent acquisition, employee engagement, um, again, employee portal, everything to do with people and data. After that, I left to a company called Tiny Pulse that was focused on employee engagement. Again, people, data, how do we measure how engaged employees are, how they're performing? And then about two and a half years ago, I founded Humanly. We're focused at Humanly on making those direct conversations you're having with your candidates more efficient and more equitable. So that's a little bit about me. Um, let's dive into what the topics are for today. And the first we're going to talk about is the rise of AI and, and in some cases where it hasn't been as prominent um, or as successful as one would hope and then areas where we really are seeing true business impact. We'll talk about how talent acquisition is changing. It's a very interesting time right now in talent acquisition. And we have an opportunity to kind of reset how we're thinking about our use of technology, um, how we continue to make talent acquisition a very human driven process. I'll then talk about some of the benefits of automation and AI, why AI can fail and how to prevent that. Um, the evolution of conversational AI, which is beginning to be more and more popular here in talent acquisition. And then examples of AI um, reducing bias in hiring. Um, if not wielded in the right ways, it can also cause more bias. So it's very important to be aware of these intricacies. Um, with that said, um, you know, at the end of this talk, I really want you all to leave with something tangible. You can also reach out to me. You should see my email right next to my um, name there um, in, in the bottom right corner, prem at humanly.io. Feel free to email me after if you have questions. We can talk about your unique challenges. But really, the three things I want you to leave with is a clear understanding of the current and near future use cases today's companies are implementing AI technology around, um, a framework for how to evaluate if these technologies are right for your organization, and then a set of questions you can ask vendors as you evaluate options. It's really important that we challenge vendors now. Um, there's a lot going on in the space and we need the questions answered. I find that a lot of buyers don't know what questions to ask right off the bat, which is perfectly normal with any sort of nascent technology, but this is a very important one for me. So let's first talk about the, the rise of AI. I know we've all heard, um, you know, at conferences, on the internet, um, in our inboxes, talk of artificial intelligence. Um, you know, there's a lot of stats out there. Um, this was one um, that Accenture did talking about how 81% of companies who embrace artificial intelligence saw 10% growth and just over half realized more than 20% growth. So on one side of things, there's lots and lots of material about artificial intelligence, about automation, really saving time, saving money, creating business impact. On the flip side of the coin, this was same year, um, Forbes wrote this, saying 65% of companies have not seen business gains from their AI investments. So lots of good stuff happening, some maybe not so good stuff happening. So what really is going on here? Um, you know, this is one last stat The Verge had saying 40% of AI startups in Europe don't actually use AI. And this isn't uh, something specific to, to Europe. Lots of data like this in the US as well. Um, many companies are using AI as a buzzword. Um, you, you hear it a lot. So I think before we dive into the details, let's let's kind of diagnose and look at what, what really is going on here. You know, at the end of the day, whatever the solution is, artificial intelligence is just one solution, automation is another solution. There's lots of ways to solve our problems, but what are the problems really? And at the end of the day, I feel people want, want to solve for a problem, whether you call it AI, you call it automation, or whatever the solution actually is. Uh, some of the things that 
we have seen, particularly when it comes to artificial intelligence and subsets of artificial intelligence like machine learning, is you know we we know that some of the problems out there that can be solved for are tiresome and tedious work, those repetitive tasks, um, faster response times. Humans can't necessarily be up 24 or seven, um, increasing the ability to meet, meet goals, allowing for real time personalization and then, and then being predictive. So when, when, I, when I look at AI, I think specifically of the subset of artificial intelligence called machine learning, which is the most common and prevalent form currently used in, in talent acquisition. And the definition here is machine learning is kind of what the words say. It's a study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience and by the use of data. It's seen as a part of artificial intelligence. And that's real, there's some really important pieces here where the, the tools are improving automatically based on the data. So we'll learn about how they take those inputs, what questions you can ask vendors to make sure the data is being used in the right ways, um, that we're actually training up algorithms to make what's, um, what we want to happen happen more efficiently. It can also make things we don't want to happen happen more quickly and efficiently. Um, so let's take a step back here and really talk about the context here of talent acquisition. Um, and then we can go back and bring in the solution. So with talent acquisition um, specifically, lots is changing. And I really truly feel that the future of staffing, you know, the future of recruiting, the future of work is now. And, and we're all feeling that. I know lots of things are changing um, and we're starting to feel that the time really is now to adapt and adjust and rethink that relationship between the human driven processes and the technologies. Um, here's a couple ways it's changing. I know we, all of us have seen this parts of the workforce become more fluid and flexible. Not all. Um, there you know, certainly are some areas, particularly in tech, where we're moving to remote work. But it's important to realize that that's not going to impact all jobs. Um, that being said, generally, we're seeing a lot of jobs become more, more flexible from where people are located to how they get the job done. We're also seeing folks switch jobs more. So reskilling is beginning to be a big trend. Um, diversity is big in terms of diversity, um, not just when possible, but by design. And that involves all kinds of diversity, not just um, uh, diversity that you can see, um, but cognitive diversity, um, different types of thinking, as well as the diversity that you can see, such as ethnic and racial diversity, gender diversity. Um, technology has evolved quite a bit. And I, I've seen this from when I was at Microsoft and, you know, back in when we acquired LinkedIn and we looked at those massive amounts of data to fast forward now to kind of what's been do, being done in talent acquisition with data at scale. And these technologies are, are no longer just places you store data and transact upon it. They're becoming intelligent systems that will actually engage with your job candidates or with your employees. So it's really important to kind of think through all of these things things. Um, another thing that happened, and this is incredibly sad for not, not just anyone in talent acquisition, but anyone in, in you know, in, in, in our country and in the world here, um, but 40% of recruiters were laid off or furloughed last year. And I know many jobs were affected. Um, we're, we're, of course, here talking about talent acquisition. Um, so this was some LinkedIn data, and this is specific to the San Francisco Bay Area, um, but we're seeing this happen across the board where, of course, there's a lot of people that lost their jobs. Um, but what's happening is, as we kind of come out of this, um, is people are kind of starting and not starting from scratch, but they're, they're rethinking, they're resetting, they're in hopefully in many cases hiring back folks that were laid off. Um, and there's being a lot of money um, being thrown into this, particularly in the startup ecosystem where we see, um, you know, the, Phil Strazulo from Select Software Reviews recently said venture capital in HR tech is exploding. And I, I see this as an entrepreneur. Um, if you look at that chart, um, you see the last couple quarters here, 
um, where things are uh, really, really are exploding. People are trying to see where they fit in this, this future of work that has really, in some ways, been catalyzed by some of the macro items, by the pandemic, by um, technology advancing, by um, candidates demanding different types of work environments. So it's really a time right now where we want to be equipped with the right knowledge to make the right decisions as we think about that future state of talent acquisition, one that includes technology, and it, but it's still human driven. And I think that's, that, that's important to not forget. Um, we're seeing a lot of our clients and our, um, as well as uh, peers, clients, and, and um, clients at large here, really kind of resetting, like I mentioned. Um, so we're, we've all are familiar with the living and working in the new remote workforce environment. Again, not impacting all jobs, but many of them. Um, the end-to-end -end candidate experience is something that's been talked about forever, but um, it's, it's very interesting to see now where, you know, particularly in these high volume jobs, 72% of job candidates now that have a negative experience will share that negative experience online. Um, and you see studies out there um, where um, Virgin Media says they lose $6 million a year, $6 million a year, because job candidates who have a negative experience will actually switch to a competitor. Um, Disney, the average Disney job candidate spends eight times more money at Disney parks than the average um, customer at large. So you're really seeing job candidates, in, particularly if you're a B2C company or your best um, customers in many ways, um, even if you're not in, in B2C, treating candidates right is extremely important for, they can be future candidates, they can be advocates. And now where, um, you know, there's unemployment's fairly high. There's certainly labor shortages in some areas, but there's massive volumes of candidates applying to jobs and people that have been really hit by COVID. Let's, let's treat them right. And let's, let's treat them in the way that, that we would want to be treated. I think that's, that's extremely important. And I know everyone here is doing a great job of that, but it's something we need to continue to push. Um, we're finding that our clients want to work harder to level the applicant um, playing field for all. And there's a lot of interesting ways that we can do that. I'll talk about how, how our company does that as well as how other companies do that. Um, one thing that's been interesting too is just seeing um, the value on safety and security. And we see this after events like wars, um, like pandemics, where you're kind of going back to, to the basics in some ways where, yes, you want all these awesome things and benefits and and um, things that make you happy at work. Um, but at the same time, the bottom line is, can I feel safe? Can I feel secure? Not, not just physically, but um, with, with that paycheck, is, is something going to happen that's going to cause our company to be in trouble? So I think when there's things that happen like, like a pandemic, um, they cause kind of that uh, re um, kind of prioritization in some ways. Um, and clients are, you know, also designing for business resilience. Uh, they they want to build businesses that that will be here for long periods of time, regardless of what's happening at a macro level, or regardless of things that are outside of their control. Um, so this is a quote I like. Um, it, it goes, "It is not the most intellectual of the species that survives." That's good for me. Um, it is not the strongest that survives good for me as well. But the species that survives is the one that is able best to adapt and adjust to the changing environment in which it finds itself. And really, it's upon us now to change. AI is one of those ways that can help us, um, but it has to be done right. So let's talk about some of the benefits of automation and artificial intelligence, specifically machine learning. Um, many of you are very familiar with, with all these, but the number one, of course, that we, we hear all the time is time saving. So can we automate repetitive tasks like sourcing, like candidate screening, like candidate engagement, like candidate re-engagement? So if a 
300 people apply to a job, 20 people get those that, that, that job. Um, what are we doing to keep engaged with the rest of the 280? Um, are we checking in with them to see if they're still qualified, interested, and available? So there's a lot around sourcing, screening, and re-engagement, where right now companies are spending a lot of money and time to attract candidates to apply to their jobs, but can you efficiently process them, keep in touch with them, um, do things before they pick something else and you know right now it's a very interesting market because there's labor shortages in many jobs especially in the hourly space and it's becoming more candidate driven you then have other industries where it's not quite like that but really time savings we know is top of mind quality is always going to be top of mind whether that's quality of candidate experience quality of hire um, so there are things that automation and artificial intelligence can do. Um, a lot of things that are really just automation or data analysis might might be called by some vendors artificial intelligence. Really, at the end of the day, we're um, you know here to get our problems solved, regardless of what the name of the solution is. Um, from a quality standpoint, yeah, re really, I, I'll mention that um, just the reduction in time to first touch. If you have, again, 300 candidates apply, can you get back to all of them with the next step in the process right away? Not just an automated email, but can you get them to a screen in 24 hours, um, get them to a recruiter very quickly um, and time to hire? Um, better, better measurement and data to, to train pe the people, because again, talent acquisition is a human driven process and I do think it will continue to be um, and then can we create better candidate experiences so maybe I apply to a job and it's a week before I get my phone screen before I can even ask those questions on the screen it's not just about a company screening me but I, I'm screening a company too and I think creating a better experience takes a few things it takes setting the right expectation it takes moving me through the process in a, in a quick way um, and these are all things that that AI and automation can, can help solve for. Um, the next is reduction of unconscious bias. So there's a lot of things that tools, um, some are AI based, some are not, but can do to, to help um, remove bias. So um, optionality in the application process. Uh, I was talking to someone at Microsoft who runs their autism hiring program and candidates with autism spectrum disorder um, pr prefer not to, in some cases, they, they want different options for how they can fill out the application. Maybe, maybe they don't want to do the specific phone screen, but would rather do it written. Or there's, there, I think the more options you can give to candidates, the better. But that doesn't mean it's now apples to oranges. You can provide optionality and still at the end of the day be processing the results in the same way. Um, consistency across screening and interviews. So if you're asking one candidate um, these 10 questions, ask another candidate 10 different questions, it's, it becomes very cumbersome and AI can measure, are you following script? Are you bringing up the topics that are most related to high candidate sentiment? Um, are you talking too fast even, which is disadvantages candidates where English is a second language. Um, one thing we found with, with our tool, one of our customers found that junior female candidates were getting seven minutes less to speak in remote interviews than their male candidates at this particular company. And we can measure that with, with our algorithms, measure patience, measure interruptions um, of these interviews. And then blind screening is one that's been around for quite a bit. So really, you know, time savings, quality, reduction of bias. This is not like a laundry list or um, this is certainly not representative of everything. These are the ones that I um, have expertise in and, and I'm very excited about. So really, there's a lot of benefits, um, you know, but at the same time, um, with, you know, great power comes great responsibility. And um, like I said before, um, AI and tech and automation can help make things move faster, but you want to move the right things faster, not the wrong things. Um, they can make things more efficient. Um, there's a lot of great opportunities here, but there's also ways where, where things fail. The amount of companies who have invested or plan to invest in chatbot solutions has jumped by 500% in the last year alone, and 80% of users are happy with the technology. The reason I pick chatbots, um, they are by no means representative of all the forms of things that can be helpful. I pick them because they're definitely been a hot topic. Um, there's been areas where they have 
really failed. Um, there's been areas where they've provided value. I think when you move beyond the chat and move towards transactions, expectation setting, um, you know, using chatbots to schedule versus just talk, you see a lot of value. So I'm going to use chatbots as an example here because I think it's one form of in some cases, AI, in some cases, many chatbots are not even using any AI. Um, but I do think, and nor should they, if, if, if the business doesn't require natural language processing and more complex um, conversations. But I will use them as an example because I think they're one many of us are familiar with. So you see a lot of companies investing there. 69% um, of people interviewed, this is a study by VentureBeat, said they'd consider talking to a chatbot before a human if they were to get those instant responses. And you've seen a lot of mistakes early on, which I think has caused an apprehension towards these automated chats. Um, here's, a, here's a headline, and I've, I've censored it, um, but here's a headline that when I saw this, this was quite a while back, but it was right around when there was a lot of hype around chatbots. Um, Twitter taught Microsoft's AI chatbot to be a racist blank in less than a day. And this really, um, this is a great example for not just chatbots, but any form of AI and, and how it can fail. Um, one quick way it can fail is if it's trained on a, on a bad set of data. So ask your vendors, how is how are the chatbots making decisions? How are they getting smarter? What data are they using? Is it your data? Is it third party data? Um, you know, are these chatbots too rigid? Um, are they trying to do too much? So I, I was talking to a vendor and they said, 70% of people that talk to our chatbot think they're talking to a real human, but I, I don't think the metric should be tricking people and, and making them think they're talking to a person. Really, this, let's be honest, this is a piece of technology that can be helpful. Let's not make it try and do too much. Um, it, it, um, you know, in some cases, it might re replace tasks that people are doing, but it's not replacing people. And I think that's a big, big difference, not necessarily replacing people, but replacing repetitive tasks that they're doing. Um, there's a lot of you know bad end user experiences. We've seen it all. Like you know, when we call into the bank or um, when we're talking to um, um, a chatbot on a website. Uh, and but I feel we're getting to a point where that can change. And then the ones that are non-transactional, people aren't here just to chat. They're here to get things done. And if the chat interface is good at getting things done, then they'll use it. Um, but can it actually like in the talent acquisition context? Can it? Um, you know, screen you? Can it schedule you? Can it re-engage you? Not just can it chat with you? Um, and then the other piece is around the data. Oftentimes we talk to folks that implement AI and they realize that um, they haven't really thought through the data piece of it. And oh, by the way, it's going to take six months before this thing actually works because it needs to be trained on our internal data. Or, you know, we implement this AI solution and we have to custom configure it. So I think th these are all things to consider um, and ways where any form of AI, including chatbots, can fail if not used in the right ways. Um, so let's step back a little bit and talk about kind of the, the evolution of conversational AI and what conversational AI and, and talent acquisition is it's the tools that can be used to replace or help humans be better at those direct conversations you're having with candidates. So whether it's a chat that's screening a candidate, asking them questions, putting them into your applicant tracking system, scheduling them, or it's tools that will listen into your interviews, um, maybe your Zoom interviews and say, hey, you didn't bring up this topic, you probably should, or you know, you're treating these candidates differently than others. Really, all those direct conversations you're having with candidates, how do we get better at them? Um, and we've seen, going back to kind of the chat space, we've seen an evolution, as I was mentioning, is chatbots to, to actual assistance to true, true conversational AI, where we're getting better at all those conversations. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about conversational AI because this is the, the piece of AI that I'm, I'm most familiar with. And, um, and a lot of the pieces here we're seeing have more to do with machine learning. In some cases, it's not true AI, um, but it is more automation. There's other components that are more predictive. 
But really, you know, we talked about some of the workplace trends. I'll get back into that a little bit, um, but then I'll get specific into technology and, to, and then into use, use cases specifically. Um, so to summarize what we've seen, I would consider ourselves right now kind of in between 2.0, that second column, and 3.0, that, that third column. Um, what we saw in 1.0, so in the past, is a lot of, you know, consumerization of IT. So bring your own device, IT departments um, allowing that, digitalization, global workforce. All, all these things are still um, and very important today, but, but they had started earlier. Um, Multi-generational workforce, so five generations in the workforce um, and more in some cases, and automation. As we kind of moved into 2.0, um, we started seeing the gig economy emerge. So a lot of these um, now gigs that you can sign up for um, and not necessarily commit full time. We saw a more transient workforce. So we saw people switching jobs more. Um, it wasn't, um, you know, one career for uh, for your one one career vertical for your whole career. One vertical for your whole career. Um, remote teams began to be more prevalent. Now we're seeing a lot more of that automation. So automation everywhere. Uh, data ownership. So there was kind of a push and, and pull as as the cloud emerged and where is the data stored? Who owns it? Um, we're seeing obviously a lot now with GDPR, with the Canada, with the um, California laws, um, more diverse workforces. But now, as we move into what's what's you know the current state, you know we see some of the same. So bigger gig economy, reskilling for sure. We, we're now seeing remote first teams become much more popular, particularly in tech. Um, Automation is, is more of an extension of what you're already doing. So how do we make ourselves give ourselves superpowers and not just add on automation to processes? We're seeing analytics that we've never seen before. So things that I mentioned before, can we actually measure if we're talking to candidates differently? Um, can we look at which skills are really predictive of success, which aren't? Um, one data set that we're looking at my company is we found that for this particular role in this particular region, the difference between four and five years of experience was not predictive of success. It might be for a different role, but not for this one. But really what was, was adaptability or coachability. Um, I mentioned candidate experience at the center and then really leveling the playing field for, for everyone. So this is what we're seeing in the workplace. Um, and we've seen from a conversational AI standpoint, um, technologies change where in the chatbot phase was, you know, these canned responses, basic communications. Now things started moving into, and there, this is where all the mistakes started to happen in 2.0. When you're trying to do a lot, um, you know, you're trying to have natural language processing and, and have these open-ended conversations. Um, and have these two-way conversations, be deeply transactional. I think we're now emerging into a space where we're learning from those mistakes on the AI front, and we're able to really deliver really powerful scenarios where the conversations are designed well. You're looking at data from different sources. So you might, you know, hop into an interview and have an assistant tell you, hey, this candidate um, seems great, but in the previous step of the interview, they didn't really do a great job on the technical assessment. You might want to jump in and ask them more about it. Um, you know, can you pull in data from many different sources to really make each interaction you have with candidates more powerful? Um, interview transcriptions, um, even things like em empathy, sentiment, and emotion. Um, are you able to detect when I talk about this topic, is it causing candidates in interview to be turned off? Or is it something that they're really passionate about? Um, you, you're now starting to see machine learning that, that works. Um, natural language process, processing that can actually look at, across cultures, identify when jargon is used, um, really contextual scenarios. So, you know, imagine a world where someone signs up, uh, they go through an AI screening chat, 
they, they apply for the job, they go through an AI screen chat, they get another chat the day before the interview saying, hey, um, I'd like to talk to you so I can help you prep for the interview. Here's what you wear, here's what to expect. Um, you know, they then go into the actual interview. Um, the interviewer is coached on how to engage them and screen them the best. Maybe when they're waiting for the interview to start, which is one of the most stressful moments of the interview, maybe they're um, given information about the interviewer. So, hey, you're going to be meeting with with um, Diana, here's a little bit about her. Um, you guys actually went to college together. Um, so being really hyper contextual, um, API based, and really to me, that's sharing of data and, and systems talking to each other and integrations that work. So a lot behind every piece of this, but we're really, you know, I feel getting into a, a scenario where the promise of conversational AI is here, and it might have not been what people expected originally. It's no longer just a chatbot. Um, as we look at the use cases, so I, I kind of talked about the technology, the workforce trend. At the end of the day, none of the tech matters if it's not solving a problem. None of the tech matters if it's not actually helping us be better at the use cases that are important to us. So here is, you know, kind of going back to the 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. And again, I'd consider us in this kind of halfway between 2.0 and 3.0 right now um, in the market. Um, 1.0 was, can we use conversational AI? And to be honest, most tools in 1.0 at 1.0 were not actual AI solutions. Doesn't really matter to the degree of if it's solving a problem, it's solving a problem. Um, but they were getting really good at collecting information from candidates, pre-screening candidates, um, new candidate engagement, basic integrations, follow-ups, scheduling. These are all very important now. So the difference between the use cases and maybe the previous slides is even the stuff in 1.0 does not have extreme adoption in the market right now. Um, so while we've kind of moved to 2.0 to 3.0, most companies are still early in this adoption curve. Um, as we look at 2.0, it's kind of that multi-touch engagement like I talked about. It's not just an isolated conversation with a candidate, then throwing them over the fence for the next person to talk to. Let's look at this holistically. Maybe they're a university candidate. Maybe they didn't get the job this time because they didn't quite have their degree. Um, let's follow up with them automatically in three and five months saying, hey, when we interviewed you last, we saw that um, you were about to finish the degree. Did you finish it? So that can all be automated through chats without a human having to jump on and, and talk to someone. And in many ways, candidates will appreciate that. It's, it can be less stressful. Um, passive engagements, or are we routinely checking that our silver medalist candidates are qualified, interested, and available? Um, you know, we have a customer that has a million candidate records in their database, um, a million people that they've talked to at some point in time. When a new job comes up and they post a new, new rec, they don't necessarily want to just take inbound. They want to see, are these million people in my database still qualified, interested, and available? Are they still living where they used to live? Did they get it, the certification now? So using conversational AI for passive engagement. So what that really means is maybe there's emails triggered out of your ATS that are linked to a, a two-way chat where we can say, hey, click on this link, let's chat. Let's get you, let's um, learn more about where you're at now and let's sync that back into your applicant tracking system. Um, better screening and scheduling, uh, reference checks, FAQs. Um, we're seeing um, some vendors um, use um, uh, conversational AI to engage their customers. So these are like staffing firms that want to not just talk to candidates, but want to talk to their customers and get MPS's net promoter score. So find out how they're doing um, and then maybe get Q&A from their customers. Um, as we go further, we're starting to see, um, you know, like I said, these kind of full cycle engagements where it's not just a chatbot at the beginning, then a human, but you're being followed throughout the process by uh, an assistant that can engage with you. Um, more niche outreach. So um, we're seeing people use particular social media groups um, um, or, you know, even Clubhouse and things of that, like that to hit certain types of candidates. Um, we're starting to see tools that help recruiters get better. So I talked about, can we give recruiters uh, and hiring managers and anyone doing an interview information to be better at the conversations they're having with candidates? Um, employee onboarding um, and then integrations that 
they actually do um, do work. Um, so that this is kind of what we're seeing on the hiring use case standpoint from a conversational AI piece. And this is one thing I'll mention. So this is um, taken from a study Avanade did when looking at the, these chats that are happening with job candidates um, and the importance of really not just buying a chat bot and implementing it, but thinking through, um, you know, what's, what's my strategy? What's my channel strategy? So do I want candidates engaged on SMS? Do I want them engaged on the web? Do I want them engaged only by people? Um, and then thinking about, um, you know, the design behind it. So it's really, really important that when you're talking to vendors that whatever automation is talking to your candidates is really trained to, to represent your brand well and to kind of give that, that personal touch, um, which is really an extension of the, um, of the overall brand. So your employer brand is, is an extension of your overall brand. Um, again, I mentioned the channels. What capabilities are we looking for? And then what are the source systems? So this is really, when I look at the source systems, this is really what data is training um, your conversational AI systems. So I can go deep with folks if they want to follow up on, you know, if you are making assessments of vendors when it comes to conversational AI, but these are some of the things to, to think about as well. Um, um, so one thing when people ask me, they, they say, um, you know, so what, what AI vendor do I choose? And I, I, I first say, you know, forget, like, let's take the, the term AI out of your head for a second. Let's start with what, what problem are you trying to solve? Um, perhaps you're trying to lower costs, um, improve your candidate experience, reduce bias. These are all things that technology, that automation, that AI can solve for. But let's start with what those problems are. So write them down, write down the problems, write down the answers, tie them to goals. Um, you're going to want these anyway, so you can measure the success of the implementation. This all, you know, it seems fairly straightforward, but it, it, I, it never I, I never fail to see folks um, that are jumping. Um, but let, let's stop, let's think about it um, and come up with that, that mental model. And the mental model I often use is, you know, think about it as, as you're hiring a human. Um, what, write out a job description for what you want your AI to do. Um, write it out in job description format. Job descriptions are things we're all familiar with. What are the roles and responsibilities? Um, you know, what, what are you hoping that um, this person has, this person or technology is going to be able to provide? So write it out as a job description and, and use that as a, a framework for how you're asking vendors questions. Like if you're interviewing a job candidate, um, in a way you're interviewing this, this AI bot or this vendor to, to be doing a lot of interesting stuff. Um, you know, I, I, another thing I do is kind of map out your entire talent life cycle. So what, what does it look like? What are those touch points? And many of you have probably already done this. So get a white, get on a whiteboard, get some sticky notes out and say, Hey, this is where our candidates are coming from. Here's the, here's the job boards are coming through. They're coming through our career page. Here's the touch points we want with them. And here are the touch points that we feel should be done by humans. Here are the truck touch points that we think should be automated. So going through that exercise before, before evaluating vendors is, is very important. Um, you know, what to avoid and how to get it right. Um, integrations, um, not to, not something to avoid, of course, but something that the devil really is in the details. Um, you go to all these AI vendor sites and they'll have logos of all the different applicant tracking systems, all the different sourcing tools, um, and, and will claim that they integrate with, integrate with them. And our website also has um, logos of, of ATSs. Um, but the integration is very important in terms of how it works. So you don't just want to throw data from one system to the other. So some things to ask might be, is it a two-way integration? So are we just getting data from candidates and putting it in the right place in the ATS? Or are we taking advantage of what data is already in the ATS and using it to inform what questions the chat is asking job candidates? Um, so what, what's being integrated? Is it one way, two way? Um, what kind of reporting is there? Is it real time? Um, these are all things to, to really make sure you dive into. And, and you can kind of go back to that exercise I was describing before where you're looking at that full talent life cycle. Think about your other systems. Think about what you're doing with Taleo or your app or success factors with your ATS and how, how the relationship works between your people, between your AI and between your ATS. 
Um, that conversational design, so that slide I showed where you're thinking about the different channels, thinking about the voice is very important. Um, so we have customers that are, you know, in, fi in financial services or professional services, they might want a more professional tone with their conversational AI um, versus a startup. They might want giffies and, and, and more fun pieces of the candidate in their candidate experience. At the end of the day, your candidate experience, right, is is a re reflection of your overall brand, of course. The employer brand is very tied to your overall brand. And, um, you know, it's it, in many ways, like I mentioned before, your candidates can be your best customers. Um, so that gets me into this next piece, candidate experience. Um, and, and think about another question as vendors is, you know, how, how accurate are these chats? So how many times does it fail? Are candidates getting their questions answered 90% of the time? Are you measuring that as a vendor? Are you not? Um, so really, really thinking about the details of the candidate experience. And, and the thing with some of this is you don't want, um, you don't want analysis paralysis, but you want to think through the right things. And what I mean by that is I sometimes see people jumping in too fast. And then oftentimes I also see people so apprehensive they're not taking the leap into doing the research so don't don't buy until you research but definitely um, don't hesitate to jump into the research um, so the data ownership you know know your rights um, um, where is the data stored um, what features do they have in place to make sure your data is stored is your data stored with other customers data is it in the cloud is it on premise um, what happens to your data when you're no longer using the service? These are questions, you know, we're, we're asking vendors, of course, not just for AI or conversational AI, but, but really AI is only as good as the data. So it becomes even more important to know the answers to these questions. Um, I skipped time and cost, but that, that's a big, um, another devil is in the detail one where um, some, some vendors are optimized to onboard quickly. Maybe they have limited functionality. Some are, um, maybe have more deep functionality. They take a longer time to implement. But the one thing I found is there isn't always that direct correlation. So you can find conversational AI chat solutions that will automate parts of talent acquisition that can actually get you a lot of value from day one. Um, you might have others that you think will get you value from day one, but at three months in, you're not seeing the value. You. And when we look at those stats around, you know, people, um, large percentages of folks saying that they implemented AI and they're not getting much back, part of it's a timing thing too. So you want to ask the right questions to make sure um, that, um, that things are happening in the right way and, and quickly enough. So I'm going to go into a few examples of reducing um, of, of AI reducing bias. So this is one that I get asked uh, about a lot. In some ways, AI can cause bias if it's not, you know, built by a group of folks that are thinking about all those different intricacies. If it's not trained on the right set of data, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some specific examples. So one is in job postings. Um, you know, this is, was an interesting stat that jumped out at me. ZipRecruiter did a study, and it said that 72% of job listings use masculine gendered words. And that might seem, um, you know, surprising. Um, words like he or even words like rock star. If you remove those, you actually get 40% more responses. So this is ZipRecruiter saying that even the words you're using in your job description um, can cause higher response rates. And this is, you know, probably one of the more common studies about this. Um, and, but really that inclusion journey and making all fit candidates feel included starts with the application. So there's tools like Textio here in Seattle, where I'm from, um, that will help you look at, are we using the words that will help convert candidates and, and allow all candidates to, to have an opportunity? Um, another way of AI reducing bias is engagement and inclusion. Um, so 85% of employees say they're not engaged in the workplace, according to Gallup. And this is, um, you know, disproportionate when it comes to um, folks from underrepresented backgrounds not feeling engaged. And one thing that, so there's a professor, Dr. Brooks Holtum, who I've worked with at my previous company, he's at Georgetown. And um, he did some research saying, you know, did, uh, this quadrant is based on did um, people stay or go? So were they stayers on the left or were they leavers on the right? 
And then the enthusiasm around that. So were they enthusiastic stayers, enthusiastic leavers, reluctant stayers and reluctant leavers? So I think in the old way of looking at things, um, I call it but in seat attrition. So measuring our people physically staying is one way of looking at things. But really the, the worst type of employee for an employer is not one that leaves. It's not even when a high performer leaves. It's when um, a, the, it's a reluctant stare. It's when a disengaged employee is staying. Um, so there's a lot of ways that tools that use AI and tools that even don't use AI, but are there's no need to um, always use AI, but to provide data and analytics can really help us here and prevent those reluctant stares. And a lot of you are already using these tools, um, like Tiny Pulse for the employee engagement space or Culture Amp um, or 15.5. Uh, Canaries is a great tool to help use uh, to help look at diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging data post hire. Cindio helps with pay equity, Amplify. So a lot of tools we can use to really help um, engage and include folks and still purpose and meaning, listen, understand what's happening, make sure that we're implementing um, payment and pay in, in fair ways, um, reducing cognitive attrition. So when I say button seat attrition, as people physically saying cognitive attrition is their mind share um, leaving, even if they're physically showing up, um, you know, supporting collaboration, elevating voices. There's a list of things we can do to engage and include and a list of tools to help us do that. Some use AI, some don't. Um, I think when we're thinking about AI, the being predictive, being uh, having algorithms that learn over time. So learning about your employee base and maybe what, what's worked, what hasn't. Um, those are all really interesting implementations. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is candidate conversations. And this is something my company is working on. There's other companies working on it as well. Um, but what can we do to really um, help us understand um, what's happening inside of those direct interviews that were direct conversations we're having with our candidates. So we have a tool that will listen into um, your remote interviews and it will give you feedback. It'll say, are we treating candidates the same? Or what topics are we talking about that really um, resonate with candidates? This is a stat um, I floated earlier um, but it's, it's really jumped out at me. And again, when we were working with one of our clients, we were finding that junior female candidates were getting seven minutes less to speak than their male counterparts. So we can now begin to use AI to not just automate and save time, but help us as humans get better at how we're interviewing people, how we're talking to our job candidates. Um, you know, this is an example of our dashboard and, you know, with this company, we're able to measure, are they sticking to script? Are they bringing up the topics that are important? What topics are candidates resonating with when they talk about their customers that really resonates? And all these are things that can help convert candidates. Um, you know, they were curious to see what percent of candidates were bringing up COVID and was it with a positive sense or a negative sense? Um, are we talking about our company values and in interviews? Are we speaking too fast? Again, that, that can be disadvantaging to certain candidates. So um, going back to the beginning, AI can help with automation. It can help automate some of those conversations you're having with candidates. It can help automate sourcing. It can automate scheduling. Um, but I think really when we're thinking of the future, this is a human driven process. So what can AI do to help our humans get better as well? Um, so, you know, that, that's uh, all I will say in closing. Um, feel free to email me. Um, you can point your camera. I'll leave this uh, QR code on there. You can point your camera at it um, if you want to schedule time with me. We're really excited to uh, meet more of you and, and um, talk with some of you um, separately. Um, feel free to reach out. And thanks again for your time.